Hello everybody, I'm back with uh, part two of, uh, really, it's really the first lecture here on uh, the assignment number three. And I want to get into a little bit more about the behind the scenes theory. In the last video, I showed you the software and I showed you the diagrams that you needed to create for assignment number three. And I said it's an exploratory exercise, which it is, um, to have you go through and see if you can um, mimic it and see if you can put together the scenarios and put together the use cases, et cetera, and so forth um, for the mine pump shaft control system. Today, I wanna to go over a little bit more of the theory. And so on the class website in the UML folder, and this one is called uh, three, the software requirements specification. If you click on number three, software requirements, SRS, you come up with this lecture here. And this is going to go through the theory. And I just kind of, I'm not going to read you the whole lecture. That would be ridiculous. Um, I would highly advise that you go through this on your own. It's 46 slides. I'm going to highlight a few things in here to kind of give you the mindset of the process that you're actually going through and how basically the use case scenarios, the requirement specification, the, ca the class diagrams and the sequence diagrams, how these things work together and why we're doing this. Um, so this is actually chapter four requirement solicitation out of the book Object Oriented Software Engineering using UML patterns in Java. At the bottom of the screen, you can see the author and the book itself if you're interested in getting an electronic copy of it um, or you know you don't have to. Uh, but that's where this information is coming from. And uh, I like this little picture because it's kind of funny. It says, what is this? Um, and your job as a software engineer is to describe this. It's like, you know, I think it's a lawnmower in a, in a yard, isn't it? Um, and so how do, you, how do you mow the lawn? That's a good question. Find the functionality first, then the object second. So it's a, it's a modeling scenario. It's like, how are you supposed to mow, mow this lawn? Um, I don't know. It's a good question. I'm looking at this going, well, what is this? So um, where are we right now? <clears throat> Looking at the abstraction. So there's three ways to deal with the complexity of a project. And this is the mindset I'm talking about in this video, not the drawing tools, but how are we thinking about this? So we have to, we, we're, some customer came to us or we were given a project and we say, here's a description of the system, put it together. Well, you have to think about it. It's an abstract concept. You have to decompose it. You can divide and conquer it. You can create a hierarchy. You can put it in layers. You can, you can use a methodology to get started on it. Um, the one that is more popular these days, because it kind of falls in line with object-oriented programming, is the object-oriented modeling or object-oriented analysis and design, where we do functional decomposition on the objects. And then we look at these objects and we say, ah, oh, that's a good starting point, or that's, 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 that's okay. So the right way is to start with a description of the functionality, maybe use a use case model, and then proceed forward to find the object model. You could do it that way. What activities and models are needed? Well, it depends on what you are doing in the software. Now, UML's got like 20 or 30 different models. You're not gonna use all of them. You're gonna use, the, and the models are the diagrams, for lack of better definition. You're not gonna use all of them um, but you're going to use ones that kind of fall in line with the software development lifecycle model. I talked about software development lifecycle models already, so I'm not really going to get into very much of that again. But you pick out a lifecycle, whether it be the iterative approach or the waterfall model. There's a lifecycle, and in the lifecycle, you're going to have uh, requirements, analysis, design, and implementation. You're going to put it together, and then along the ways, you're going to create some diagrams. For example, if you're doing requirements elicitation, which is this first box over here, which is really the first step, which is what you're doing in assignment number three, then you're doing use case modeling. After you have the requirements and go through an analysis of it, you could do and create some domain objects or maybe do some subsystems and continue with the object designs and object diagrams. And then at the end, you're gonna do some testing diagrams. Um, but this is kind of a rough sketch of some of the diagrams and where they would fall into place. Usually everything except for, you know, use case modeling usually happens first and then everything else happens in a sequence after that. So we have the requirements elicitation, which is the problem description. And then we have the requirements analysis, which is the problem specification that comes out of there. 
and then we would take a take an approach to gather the requirements so defining a system boundary and i talked about system boundaries and scope creep in uh, one of the lectures before the midterm already um, is important because you want to know where the system um, stops and what things are part of the solution and what's not because it's kind of like building a house and someone keeps adding on features. Oh, I think we should have a second story. Oh, I think we should put a swimming pool in the back. Or we should do this, we should do that. And what ends up happening is the project gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And it really, is this part of the house or is this the landscaping or is this something else? Um, so products of the requirements process, you come out with the problem statement. You come out with the requirements that are um, specified out and they turn into system specifications essentially. This is actually what's called an activity diagram. We aren't doing an activity diagram uh, for our projects, but you could put together an activity diagram if you're having problems trying to understand what the system boundaries are and what actually needs to go into the software. So the bridging the gap between the user and the development usually comes in the form of those scenarios. Um, those are the textual descriptions of what's going on in the system. And then the use cases, which is a description of the class of scenarios uh, with the actors, as I, I covered in the previous lecture. So. so this is system specifications versus the analysis model. The analysis model generally is uh, the modeling tools and it's the notation and it's the artifact that comes out of the analysis and the system specification that's the language uh, of the problem statement those are the non-functional and the functional requirements and those go into the requirements uh, the document itself so the starting point is usually the problem statement we start with a problem statement and then we work forward um, sometimes it's also called the statement of work um, depending upon how big your company is a good problem statement describes the current situation, what functionality we're trying to accomplish in the system, the environment that the system is going to be working in. The problem statement is what I gave you in the assignment. It's that couple of paragraphs describing the mine shaft control system. So you started with a problem statement that was given to you already. And now you're going to decompose that into functional and non-functional requirements. So. You're looking at the problem to be solved and you're going to describe one or more scenarios and the requirements are going to fall into functional and non-functional uh, categories with some constraints which might be pseudo requirements like you know there it must be able to call the police department or the fire department or emergency services you don't have to worry about a project schedule but if this were a real project you'd probably have to figure out how you're going to how you're going to deliver it on time and what's going to be done in the different stages maybe also a target environment uh, and maybe some client acceptance criteria that would also be appropriate uh, that might fit into this particular stage so let's see um once we figure out the problem we figure out the problem domain and then we figure out well, you know, what, what, what is part of the solution? For example, here's an arena, the problem. So the, uh, the internet has enabled virtual communities. We have groups of people sharing common interests that are playing together. Many multiplayer computer games are going on. This is an example. Uh, current game company develops each uh, community support for the individual games. So this uh, redundancy and inconsistently, inconsistency <clears throat> leads to problems higher learning curve for players joining the new community, which means, you know, there's, there's nothing to get them started. Game companies, they develop and support from scratch. Advertisers, they need to contact individuals in the community separately. There's no way of getting at them um, altogether. And so the objectives here provide some infrastructure for operating an arena. So this is pretty much describing the problem of an arena that doesn't really exist, but you've got game players and you got this virtual community, but there's no organization for it. So the objective here is to add the organization. And this is just a scenario. Supporting communities, registering new games, new players, organizing tournaments, um, setting a framework, and developing new games for adapting existing games into the arena framework and keeping it all organized and creating an infrastructure as well. So some of your requirement examples here, this types of requirements, <clears throat> um, the functional requirements, 
would describe the interactions between the system and its environment. So the arena operator should be able to define a new game. And that would be a functional requirement. In the non-functional requirement, the response time maybe is a good one. Or the arena server must be available 24 hours a day. The system would still work if the server wasn't available and the system would still work if the response time was two minutes instead of one second. And then the, an example of a constraint or pseudo constraint might be that the, uh, have, you have to implement this in Java. Oh, okay. Maybe because something else in the system is also working in Java. I don't know. Um, or that the arena must be able to dynamically interface to existing games provided by other game developers. So something outside of the control system. So, so what's usually not in the requirements? So, because you're going to need to think, well, what am I going to put in for the mineshaft stuff? You don't normally put the programming language in there, by the way. Uh, the system structure, the implementation technology, the development methodology. You don't say, oh, we're going to use the waterfall model. Development environment, uh, implementation language, as I mentioned before. I would never say I'm going to use Java for this. Uh, reusability, that should not be in the requirements. So, it is desired that none of these of the above are constrained by the client. Um, which really, yeah, you, you pretty much have to figure out what is needed to make the system actually Im implementable and not too overly constrained so that you can't put it together. And then there's this concept of requirements validation where we're going to verify and we're going to validate. To validate means we've created a valid solution to the problem. It's correct. There's correctness. Represents the client view. There's completeness. All possible scenarios are accounted for. There's consistency. Then the functional and the non-functionals don't, um, don't contradict each other. There's realism. There's traceability. I talked about traceability a little bit in the previous lecture. Meaning everything in the requirements document should be traceable to something in the design document uh, for the most part. And the design document is um, the document that's, got, that's going to contain all your design components. For example, the use case scenarios, the class diagrams, the sequence diagrams. All that stuff actually would go separately in a requirements, <clears throat> excuse me, in a design document. So the problem with requirements validation, requirements change. They change very fast and they change before the project is even finished. Um, so there's tools that you can use. Uh, we're not really going to get into the tools in this particular class, but if this were a graduate level class, you'd look at some of the case tools, the automated software engineering tools that keep track of version control, they keep track of changing requirements, um, and then, you know, the whole requirements managing process. Okay, so let's say we have our requirements down. We've done some requirements elicitation, which means we've gathered the requirements. And now we're looking at the concept of the scenario. So from the requirements, and in your particular case, you're starting with someone giving you a summary of the problem. And you're going to create the requirements. Now the scenario is a narrative description of what people do and experience as they try to make use of the computer system or application. How are they using the system is a, probably a better way of saying it. <laughs> so what's the vision? How should they be using the system? There's different types of scenarios. There's as-is scenario, visionary scenarios, evaluation scenarios, training scenarios. Um, how, would we, how would we teach new people how to use the system? How are we going to evaluate if the system is effective or not? These are different types or different approaches to looking at the concept of the scenario. How do we find the scenarios? We don't expect the client to be, uh, to, to be verbal in the system. Um, for example, we don't have, we're not going to have the client tell us what their scenarios actually are. Um, this is where you're going to spend some time looking at that mind, um, mind pump control system and just kind of think about and write down and maybe you can just scratch down on a piece of paper some notes um, as you read through the description multiple times and kind of say, well, where are these scenarios? They're just going to pop out eventually. And then you're going to have to condense the list down so that you don't have any duplicates in there either. So, yeah, you know, don't wait for information even if the system exists. Um, engage in dialect approach. Well, yeah, um, if you had people to talk to, you could formulate some information with the client and go back and forth and talk about the scenarios.
Um, so heuristics for finding the scenarios in the real world, you'd, you'd, you'd question the, the, uh, the client. Ask yourself and the client the following questions. What are the primary tasks the system needs to perform? What data will the actor, creator, store, change, remove, or add in the system? What external changes does the system need to know about? What changes or events will the actor or the system need to be informed about? Um, so don't rely on questionnaires alone. Well, you're not going to be able to question the client. So you're going to have to sort of, and you could use this sort of a checklist on, for some heuristics for finding the scenarios. Uh, they would work, actually, for the mind pump system. Here's an example of an accident management system. Hmm, very similar to the mind pump. What needs to be done to report a cat in a tree incident? What do we need to do if a person reports a warehouse is on fire? Who's involved in reporting an accident? How does the system do? Well, what does the system do if no police cars are available? If the police cars has an accident on the way over to the cat in the tree incident, what happens? What do we do if uh, the cat in the tree turns into a grandma has fallen from the ladder trying to get the cat out of the tree? Can the system cope with a, uh, cope with a simultaneous incident report with a warehouse on fire? We have multiple things happen at the same time. Your accident management system, these are some scenarios that might happen with it. So for your scenarios on the mine pump, it's going to be, you know, what happens if the methane level gets too high or the air quality gets too low or the water level gets too high? Um, so here's some uh, scenario examples. Bob driving down Main Street in his patrol car notices smoke coming out of a warehouse. His partner, Alice, reports the emergency from her car. I'm not going to read through the whole thing. But uh, you see there's a series of events that are occurring these events are part of the scenario. You can read through this on your own at a slower pace. So concrete scenarios describe a single instance of reporting a fire incident. It doesn't describe all the possible situations in which the fire can be reported. For example, if it's a building on fire, a warehouse, a retail store, the cat's on fire, something's on fire, you wanna make the scenarios as generic as possible. And then your participating actors in this particular case, if you read through that previous slide, are Bob, Alice, and John. Those are the guys that are involved in this. So then you're going to take these and formulize, uh, formulate them into uh, actual scenarios and find all the use cases in the scenario that specify all the possible instances of how to report a, file, uh, a fire. For example, uh, report emergency in the first paragraph of the scenario is a candidate for a use case. Describe each one of the use cases in more detail. This is where you're doing with the templates. You're putting together a use case description with participating actors, description of the entry condition. Describe the flow of the events, the exit condition, the expectations. This is what you're doing with the documentation with coming up with a description for each one of the use cases. And then your diagramming takes place. So a use case uh, is a flow of events in the system, including interaction with the actors. It's initiated by an actor. The actor is always the stick figure. In some diagrams, it's a bubble, like report emergency, which is the actual action. Um, so the use case model is a set of all use cases specifying the complete functionality of the system. And here's what it might look like. We have a field officer who reports an emergency. They have a dispatcher who opens up an incident and allocates resources. So it's, um, you know, kind of primitive. It looks like the diagrams I showed you in the previous lecture. Um, you can do these by hand. You don't actually have to use a diagramming tool for this. So how do you find these use cases? Eh, you got to think about the system. Select a narrow vertical slice of the system, one scenario at a time, work with one scenario at a time and define how it works and define the scope and how it, how it relates to the user. Uh, make some observations, put out some questionnaires, walk through it. You can even prototype it um, with visual support, you know, to, to show the user um, if you were going back and forth between a client. So here's a use case example with a reporting of an emergency. The use case name is report emergency. This is just a template filled out, participating actors or the field officer, the dispatcher, exceptions. This would be equivalent, and I gave you a slightly different template to fill out. This would be equivalent, and you can use this one if you want. You don't like the one in the assignment description. It's just a template that you're filling out for each one of the use cases. 
It allows the developer who is going to put the system together to gather this information so they know how the pieces are supposed to work. Some information on the actors and allocating the resources. Here's a list of the actors and uh, allocating the resource scenario. And each one of these has a has a template filled out in this particular lecture. So we have this includes and uh, the includes notation was actually in the diagram that I showed you in the previous lecture. And uh, what I'm talking about is this up here where it says includes and it's written on the line that goes in between the different components. So here for a problem, a function in, in the original problem statement is too complex to be solvable immediately. The solution describes the function as an aggregate of a set of simpler functions. The associated use case is decomposed into smaller use cases. The smaller use cases are included in the main one. So the include just says this one leads to that one and it's a subpart of it. So in the diagram you put includes in there to show kind of the hierarchy of what's happening here. Um, and then the reuse of the existing functionality or for example um, you already have the functionality in here um, let's say it's a you know view map or a supplier's use case is going on. You can put the includes in here. There's sort of allocate the resources and open an incident are all part of the, the view map. Um, so the base class cannot exist alone. It always is called by a supplier use case in this particular case. So don't be afraid to put the includes in there. Include just means it's a part of. It's uh, associated with it. And then there's extends. So the association of the use case here, the functionality of the original problem statement needs to be extended. Means it's uh, includes, means it's part of it. Extends means it's another thing that comes from it as a result. It extends association from a use case A to a use case B indicates that B is an extension of the use of A. So instead of, it's like the opposite. Instead of that scenario or that use case being part of or included in the main one now it's an extension or product of the uh, original so extends means it further elaborates on or further creates an extension instead of uh, it's already inside of it so. we have a thing called a generalization as well um, you don't really see you see the extends and you see the includes the includes is inside, extends is a byproduct or product of the relationship. Um, the generalization means it's a member of it. So it's common behavior among use cases. You want to factor this out. The generalization um, factors out the common behavior. The child use case inherits the behavior of the parent and uh, overrides some of the behavior. But again, it's more of a generalization of like, for example, I would say that um, breeds of cats were a generalization of the concept of a cat. Um, so you can think of it more of a hierarchical thing if you'd like. Um, it's uh, not usually in the diagram unless you're doing a, a class hierarchy diagram, you'll see the generalizations. You probably won't use any generalizations in your use case scenarios. But here's an example of actually how the, you know, the generalizations would work. You know, if you had the top level use case with the lower level, lower level, lower level, lower level ones and participating objects that are part of the bottom and a hierarchical structure, you could have uh, subsections of use cases that are belong to other use cases. Um, so participating objects in a hierarchy. So. How to specify a use case. Summary of it, you name the use case, identify the actors, identify the entry, the flow of the events, look at the templates uh, to see what should be involved with that. Um, and uh, this is not an easy task. In fact, most projects go wrong um, at the requirements elicitation stage. And the software development lifecycle model that we're following is more of an iterative or a spiral approach in that we're doing all of these at the same time. 
So you're writing their software requirement spec while you're doing the use case scenarios, while you're creating the sequence diagram and you're putting together the class diagrams. So don't think that one needs to come before the other. You're actually supposed to be working on all of these at the same time simultaneously. And as you work on one, it'll give you insights for another, and then it'll give you insights for another. And then, so they all, all of them come together kind of simultaneously, if possible. In the real world, you'd have people from uh, the team, different people working on the different diagrams, and then you'd come together to share what you had. And then there's a lot of rework because someone might put something in a diagram that somebody else left out or had a different imagination for. And so there's not always consistency. With one person doing all of the diagrams, you have a lot more consistency. And the trend today is to make that team smaller. Have one or two people think together and have consistent diagram, consistent requirements. Um, and so you're going to naturally find that one of the diagrams is going to be your favorite. Probably the sequence is my guess. Um, that's my favorite. Um, and that you're probably going to do the sequence diagram first, and then you're going to build everything else from the sequence diagram. It is possible that that's what you're going to experience. Um, or, you know, if you're, you're, th you're more of a program kind of focused, object focused person, you might think that the class diagram is the easiest thing because immediately you're thinking about building the software and programming it. And so your focus initially might just be on the class diagram, and then you're going to build the sequences from that. So wherever you start is wherever you start. Where you end is hopefully with completion of all of these different diagrams. Um, and you hopefully you end up with a, the concept of the system coming together from multiple different angles, all related to the problem statement. And uh, the caveat that you really need to kind of pay attention to is only keep the system to the Confine, confined to the requirements that are specified in the system description. If you start adding features onto the mine pump shaft system, you're going to start complicating your life and you're never going to end up finishing this assignment. So the assignment is only worth five points. Those five points are the same as any of the other assignments. Just don't make it your life project. Take a stab at it. See if you can get the um, diagrams to work. See if you can get the scenarios to work. And so in the uh, next video uh, for our next class meeting, um, I will switch on to a different topic. We're going to, um, well, we're getting back into swing to um, GUI programming and to Java stuff. Um, but I will definitely keep you posted on uh, the class activities. Uh, we are still online. I assume that sometime after the spring break, we might actually go back to face-to-face, -to -face, but I will keep you posted. And so keep me posted. If you have questions, problems, or concerns, send me an email message. And uh, don't wait too long before you get help with something. And uh, good luck and stay safe. And I will catch you for another video soon. Talk to you later.